Ireland, born in Ireland, grew up there, and was educated uh, in Ireland. When he was in 1927, uh, he won a very uh, important scholarship and went to Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University to study for a doctorate. Turned out uh, that that was a very remarkable place at a very remarkable time. Uh, nuclear physics was well underway at the time, as you had described to you. Uh, nuclear physics was being done in those days with uh, uh, natural radioactivity sources. Uh, there was something uh, truly lacking in the facilities for doing nuclear physics, and, and of course, uh, we all know what it is. Uh, there were no particle accelerators when Dr. Walton went there. There were when he left, and that's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, remarkable uh, things that went on there, including the uh, beginning of particle accelerators. After 1934, Professor Walton went back to Ireland, uh, back to his uh, university, the University of Dublin, and spent most of his uh, career there. In 1938, the Royal Society of London recognized the important work that he had done with uh, the Hughes Medal awarded annually by the Royal Society for Outstanding Achievement of Science. And of course, uh, as you know, in 1951, the same effort was recognized with the Nobel Prize. In uh, 1948, uh, Professor Walton was given the chair, a very famous chair of physics at Dublin University. Erasmus Smith's Chair of Physics, and for his career since then, he has been, uh, he's held that Chair of Physics. He retired from his position there about a year ago, and this fall he is visiting a distinguished professor of physics at North Texas State. We're extremely pleased that you're with us. Thank you. Thank you. start by contradicting the chairman in some respect, and that is the statement that there were no accelerators in the Cavendish laboratory when I went there. Strictly speaking, that is not true because there were X-ray tubes. What is an X-ray tube with an accelerator of electrons? <laughs> <laughs> now, I uh, perhaps might mention my credentials for speaking on the subject of the early history of accelerators. <coughs> they are briefly that I have had practical experience with five different types of accelerator. Uh, linear accelerator, Betatron, the Van de Graaff machine, voltage multiplying circuit, and the resonant transformer type of accelerator. We were trying various sorts of accelerator in the early days. Now, uh, what I have to tell you is mainly about work in Europe uh, and just a little bit about what I've done in this country. But because of my <coughs> emphasis that way, I don't <coughs> want to think that I don't know about or recognize the importance of the work which was done in this country in the early 1930s. You will, in fact, get a very uh, good and entertaining account of the early work of accelerators in the book published by, or uh, written by Stanley Livingston and published some oh, five to ten years ago. Now, uh, the real urge for producing fast uh, particles arose out of Rutherford's disintegration of nitrogen in 1919. And in the following years, many people rushed into this field, bombarded various elements with the natural alpha particles from radioactive substances. But although uh, these experiments were of importance in showing uh, the details of what went on in some of these nuclear interactions, it became rather dull 
because there were no new exciting things appeared. All of the nuclear reactions up to uh, the early 1930s were of one type. An alpha particle went into a nucleus and a proton came out. And uh, the experiments which you could do were very limited because you were limited by the strength of available radioactive sources. <coughs> now, as far as I was concerned, I just mentioned um, how I got involved <coughs> in the problem of accelerating particles. Shortly after reaching the Cavendish Laboratory, Rutherford sent for me to discuss the subject of research. And I suggested to him the problem of producing streams of fast particles artificially. Now I knew at the time that to get a charged particle into a nucleus, it would have to have an energy of some millions of electro, uh, electron volts, and that such high voltages were quite impossible in the laboratory, and even if you had those voltages, you would have great difficulty in getting a vacuum tube to stand up to them. And so I suggested to Rutherford uh, a method of producing fast electrons in the first instance. Now the first slide will show you the apparatus which was constructed. The method that I suggested wasn't uh, particularly practical. And Rutherford, bearing in mind some experiments which J.J. Thompson was doing in the laboratory at that time on what was called the electrodes discharge, suggested a modification of my proposal. And uh, the idea was simply this, that if you send a high frequency current through a coil wire represented in this apparatus by this coil here that will run this evacuated tube, that you would get an alternating magnetic field parallel to the axis of this, and you would therefore get an induced EMF round in a circle like this inside the tube. So if you had a tungsten filament here with these electrons, it was hoped that some of these electrons would go round and round in this magnetic field and get speeded up to high energies. Now, uh, <coughs> the method of the detection of the fast electrons was hopefully that some of them would fly out and hit the wall that would produce X-rays which could be detected by a Goldie electroscope, the commonly used instrument of those days. Now, when I mention a high frequency current, in those days this meant getting a, a large induction coil and connecting it to a circuit consisting of a spark gap and a capacitor and a, a coil, the coil being around this tube. And by sparking, you could get trains of damp oscillations. Now, at no time did I ever find any evidence whatever for the acceleration of electrons in this apparatus. And the reason was obviously that at the time, nothing whatever was known about the focusing of particles and keeping them on, say, a circuit or track in an accelerator. So when the method wouldn't work, the only thing that, well, one thing to do was to see why it wouldn't work and some mathematical calculations, which were done at the time, I think the next slide actually shows you the final result of these, showed that you could introduce radial stability in the motion of the electron by certain arrangements. One was to have a magnetic field which fell off inversely with the radial distance, and the field which I was using at the time was one which increased with the radial distance and would have produced a defocusing action. And as well as that, to have a small steady magnetic field shown by this, and to have a radial 
electric being superimposed. <laughs> now, at the time, I didn't consider axial stability, but in, as a matter of fact, this result that I had here ensured axial stability. Next slide, please. Now, I'm not going into the details of this. This was the crude sort of circuit used in those days for producing radio frequency oscillations, spark coil, <coughs> capacitors, and inductances. And uh, here was a tube with uh, uh, an electric field, a radial electric field applied between this cylinder and this cylinder. The next slide shows the type of apparatus <coughs> used. Uh, here it is. And uh, filament here to give you electrons. Well, again, with this, the arrangement was far too crude and uh, no fast electrons were obtained. Uh, next slide, please. Well, when you can't get uh, what you want with one, uh, one method, uh, a good thing to do is to try and think of an alternative method. So I remember one day sitting down in the laboratory where I was working to try to think of alternative methods and I got on to the idea of the linear accelerator which will probably be familiar to most of you series of cylinders of increasing length the odd ones are connected together the even ones connected together and you apply a radio frequency voltage between the two sets and positive particle crossing from there to there when that's positive and that ne negative will be Accelerated. There will be no feed on it when it's inside this cylinder, and in the meantime, the feed will have reversed. And if you get another push here, similarly, another push here, so by the time it's gone through this series of cylinders, you should have a nice feed part. Now, theory indicates <coughs> that the best particle to use was a heavy particle, and to use as high a frequency and as high a voltage as you could get. Uh, next slide, please. Now, unknown to Rutherford, or indeed unknown to uh, anybody in the Cavendish laboratory, a paper had been published on this subject some few years previously. The time this was early 1928. And uh, there was a paper published, it came out in 19, uh, late <coughs> 1928, published by Vidoro, in which he describes this method. It's basically the method of the Betatron, and also describes the method of the linear accelerator. And this is a diagram taken from his paper showing you these consecutive cylinders. Now, on this diagram, you can see that there are balls over the ends of the cylinders in order to ensure that inside you had a free, free space region. <coughs> and I had these gauzes on my apparatus too. Now, Vidoro, uh, next slide please, was able to show using this apparatus here, he had uh, just two gaps and he had a sort of step up transformer here um, applying a radio frequency voltage to this and you got a double acceleration here and here. He was able to show that he got particles of energy twice that corresponding to the applied voltage and he uh, did not do anything further at that time on this. Next slide please. Now he also in the same paper uh, got onto this idea of the, the beta tron. And here is the essential part of the apparatus. You have got a transformer here with a primary winding here. And then from here you have a vacuum <coughs> tube. And you should get when the current is changing here. <coughs> you should get an EMF induced around this circuit. Now, he used a guiding <coughs> to uh, guide the electrons round 
think the next slide gives some details of it. Uh, this is the arrangement for firing the electrons into this circular tube. Now he succeeded in showing that he could get electrons one and a half times round in this transformer arrangement, which meant in effect that he was probably producing electrons of somewhere between 5 and 10 electron volts energy. Not a, a very big achievement, but still it showed the principle of the arrangement. <coughs> now, in this paper of Beethoven's, there was reference made to a paper published in Sweden by a, a Swede of the name of Ise. And the next slide, I think, shows the diagram taken from his upper, from his uh, paper. The, he didn't do any experimental work on this, and he published the paper in 1924, about four years previous to the time I've been talking about. And uh, he was on to this uh, idea of successive cylinders here, but he had a cruder arrangement. His idea was to have a spark gap here, you'd get a sudden pulse coming along, raising the potential of this, and then you had a delay line between this and the next cylinder, so that by the time the particle was in the neighborhood of the next cylinder, it had a high voltage, and this was back again to Earth potential. And a still longer delay line to the next cylinder. Now you will notice, well this of course wouldn't give you the same intensity, uh, the same output current as if you were using continuous high frequency oscillations. Now he noticed that he also had grids on the end of the cylinders and this in fact was a great mistake because uh, it removed the focusing action that you get between two cylinders when they're open-ended. And it was one of the reasons why it was so difficult to get anything out of this linear accelerator that I was working on. And of course, at that time, nobody knew anything about the focusing of particles uh, in any of these forms of accelerator. Now, this paper of Vigoros was of very great importance because it was responsible <laughs> for starting Ernest Lawrence on to work on accelerators. And I'll explain that to you using, as far as I can remember, the exact words <coughs> used by Lawrence when he described this to me and a few other people on a train journey between Stockholm and Uppsala in 1951. He said that he had come to the end of the research that he was doing in Berkeley and was trying to get some ideas for a new line of research. And he went into the library to have a look at the current periodicals. And there were a number of these set out and he took <coughs> some of them up at random and he happened just by chance to pick up the German publication in which Vidaro's paper appeared. And he just flicked over the pages and some of the diagrams caught his eye. And uh, he started studying the paper. He said he knew practically no German, uh, but he said that he could figure out what Vidaro was doing by just studying the diagrams. Well, this led him on to the linear accelerator and uh, he and Sloan succeeded in producing something like 180,000 electron volt mercury ions using only about 20,000 volts applied between the cylinders. Now, Lawrence at that stage saw the limitation of the linear accelerator, which was that if you were to increase the length you would increase the capacities between these various cylinders and the charging currents required would become very heavy and this would involve you in large power problems. And so 
he tried to think of some method of economizing on power, and he saw that by using a magnetic field, he could bend the track of the particles up into a circle, and they could use the same accelerating voltage over and over again as they went round and round. In other words, you have the cyclotron. And Lawrence showed, of course, that um, it so happened that the particles were automatically synchronized in crossing the gaps, <laughs> provided that you didn't have anything like relativity effects coming in. Next slide, please. Now, this is actually the apparatus used by uh, Lawrence and Sloan. Here is the linear uh, accelerator tube, and this is some of the uh, auxiliary equipment. <coughs> Next slide, please. Now, we're at a period of, say, somewhere around about uh, <coughs> 1929. And we had a visit at that time in Cambridge from George Yamal, who was interested in applying the then new wave mechanics to various problems in physics. And the problem that he was interested in at the time of his visit to Cambridge was the problem of the emission of alpha particles from radioactive nuclei. Why was it that they came out with these energies, very often with energies which were not as high as the height of the potential barrier surrounding the nucleus. And he showed uh, that on the wave picture of the particles, that it was possible for the alpha particle to escape through the barrier surrounding the nucleus even when it hadn't the energy necessary to get it to the top. And this is represented here on this type of diagram, very well known diagram. Here is the potential barrier around the nucleus. You have an alpha particle this side of it represented by this wave. Calculations show that some of the wave should appear on the other side. The amplitude would be greatly reduced. But because there is a non-zero amplitude on this side, it means that there is a non-zero probability that the alpha particle will appear on the other side of the barrier, although on classical mechanics it should never get out. The same problem was being tackled here in the United States by Condon and Gurney and published about the same <coughs> time. Now Cockroft so that this, these calculations could be used in reverse and that the formula would give you the probability that if you fired, say, a proton at the nucleus of an atom, there was a small chance that it would appear inside the nucleus. The chance would be very small, but because uh, you could use enormously greater number of particles than you could get from any available radioactive source, you made up for the small probability by using a very large number of particles. It's one of the very few cases that I know of where you can make up for a lack of quality by quantity. <laughs> <laughs> now the next picture shows Cockroft here on the left and Gamma on the right and they're discussing this problem of the penetration of particles through barriers. It was taken at the time of Gamma's visit. And the next picture shows that the result of the discussions were satisfactory. <laughs> but Cockroft drew Rutherford's attention to this um, result and uh, it was decided that it would be better to give up trying to make these trick methods of producing fast particles work and to build a straightforward set that would operate on a reasonable voltage <coughs> and uh, 
would give you a reasonable cut. Now, uh, <coughs> next slide shows you the first sort of apparatus that we built. Uh, we have, this shows you two rectifiers for rectifying the voltage, the alternating voltage from a transformer, <coughs> and you can see the output terminal of the transformer behind. Now, in those days, you could not, by commercially, be rectifiers that would produce the necessary high voltage. And even if you could have bought them, the Cavendish Laboratory didn't have the funds for buying them. So the only thing to do was to make uh, up some homemade uh, apparatus. This shows you two continuously evacuated rectifiers put in series, and they're evacuated through a third tube of the same sort by the oil diffusion pump down below. Matter of fact, the oil diffusion pump that we had there was one of the very first oil diffusion pumps made by the Metropolitan Vickers Company in England, and they sent this one to the Cavendish Laboratory. Now, I'm not going to the details of the technical difficulties that we, we had with that. We spent quite a long time trying to develop apparatus, vacuum tubes that would stand the necessary voltages. Next slide, please. Um, we uh, took a, a, a circuit that was due to, uh, to grind her and modified this to make it suitable for high voltage work. And the circuit is shown here, a number of rectifiers, one above the other, and a number of capacitors. Now I haven't time to go into the details of this circuit, but one important aspect of this that no single capacitor is required to withstand the full voltage which appears at the top and earth potential down at the bottom. And uh, further, that these rectifiers are all connected together and these could all be inside one envelope, evacuated by one pump at earth potential. Now this was a great practical convenience. <coughs> the next slide, please. This shows you the apparatus which was eventually built. Now it looks very crude by modern standards, but it was all that we could do at the time uh, in getting uh, this potential and to get it uh, in working in a sufficiently satisfactory method. The transformers here, and here are four rectifiers, <coughs> one on top of the other, just big glass cylinders, which we found the best type of vacuum tube, provided you had suitable electrodes inside, and just uh, plates of galvanized iron stuck in between <coughs> these, with suitable holes for pumping through. This was to distribute the potential reasonably uniformly uh, up this column. Now there were four of these tubes, each of them three feet, so the distance from here up to the top was somewhere around about 12 feet. So you had to get great high ladders when anything went wrong, and very often happened. <laughs> and uh, this voltage was applied to the accelerating tube here, which was a two-section tube, and uh, the gap here, the gap down here, and down below a little hut, which was uh, to screen us from the electric fields we were dealing with voltages of about 700,000 volts, and to screen us from the X-rays that were produced in these various vacuum tubes. The precautions taken in those days for screening you from X-rays were very crude. We used to have a fluorescent screen that we looked at now and again, and if we saw blinding flashes coming from this tube, <laughs> we would try to put up a little bit more lead. <laughs> Um. Now here's uh, this accelerating tube again, a proton source up at the top. The power was supplied from an alternator here driven by uh, a rope from an electric motor down at Earth potential. And uh, uh, here is this little hut that we had down below, and the fast particles appeared down here, 
and we could make our observations down there. Well, um, the usual procedure when you're starting a day's work was to start this up early in the morning. At the time you had the book in the working order, I was carrying out this procedure uh, this morning, and uh, uh, the apparatus was working very well, so we switched on the proton current, and uh, we had a lithium target in down below, fluorescent screen, and a microscope to look at the fluorescent screen and see if there were any scintillations produced by fast particles. Well, I remember leaving the control table, which was some yards away, uh, with the high voltage on, creeping across to this little hut, my hands and knees to avoid the high voltages, and getting inside and looking through the microscope. And lo and behold, there were a whole lot of scintillations on the screen. I'd never seen an alpha particle scintillation before, but they, they looked exactly as described in the textbooks. And so I, I got on to Cockcroft and uh, he came along and uh, we repeated the experiments, switched off the proton current to make quite sure that the scintillations disappeared then, and uh, a, a few other simple tests to make quite sure we weren't making fools of ourselves. And then uh, we got on to Rutherford, and he wasn't long in coming down to have a look at these scintillations. Well, this was a very tiny little, little box. <laughs> Rutherford was a big, big man, looking more like a prosperous farmer than a university professor. And uh, with great difficulty, we maneuvered him into this little hut down below. And he sat on a little stool down there, looking through the microscope. And he would issue instructions to us to increase the voltage, or to decrease the voltage, or to increase the proton current, and so on. I didn't say anything about what he saw. And then he came out, and he sat down on a nearby stool, as his custom was when he wanted to talk to you about what you were doing. And he said something like this, that he had seen these scintillations, that these looked mighty like alpha particle scintillations, and that he ought to know an alpha particle scintillation when he saw one. <laughs> he said he'd been working with alpha particles from the very early days uh, over the years. He said, to put it in this form, he was in at the birth of the alpha particle, which was quite true. I thought shortly afterwards that he might have added he was in at this christening as well as the birth, <laughs> for it was he who gave the alpha particles their name. Well, uh, we uh, carried out very quickly a number of experiments uh, to get as much information as we could about what was happening. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, what was happening here, at least what we thought was happening, was a proton going into a lithium-7 nucleus and giving rise to two alpha particles shot out in opposite directions at the same moment. And to check up on that, we got used this arrangement here, stream of fast protons coming down onto a very thin lithium target, just a sprinkling of lithium oxide on a thin piece of mica. And the idea was that if one alpha particle came out here, it could be observed by this observer. And if the corresponding one in the opposite direction came out here and hit this fluorescent screen, it would be observed here. And the two observers had got keys, and we could press a key when we saw an alpha particle. And these uh, uh, keys uh, caused a mark on a piece of moving paper. Um, this has been described as the uh, first coincidence count. <laughs> I think that the resolving time was rather poor. I think it was something like half a second. Uh, but there was no doubt about it that we were getting far too many coincidences for it to be just a matter of pure chance. Next slide, please. Now, the <coughs> after getting information about the range of these particles and the way in which they uh, varied with voltage 
and the way in which the ionization along these tracks varied with the distance along the track. Uh, in other words, we got a bright curve for these particles, and the bright curve looked exactly the same as the bright curve for natural alpha particles. Now, it was all uh, very satisfactory, but we wanted to make quite sure, and the really sure method was to get photographs taken of what was happening in a Wilson chamber. And at this stage, we got uh, Philip D to come in. Uh, I mentioned him last night at the banquet. He was an expert on the use of the Wilson cloud chamber and the photography involved. So he brought his techniques to bear on this problem. And uh, we had this apparatus here, protons coming down, a shutter so that we could cut off the beam quickly, but we only wanted uh, protons coming down here uh, during a short interval of time uh, while the expansion was being made. And here is the Wilson chamber down here. And there were two cameras looking in here from two opposite sides so that we could reconstruct in space what was happening. Next slide, please. Oh, something's gone wrong. It's got stuck. Well, this shows you one of the early photographs that we got. The beam coming down here, the lithium target inside a box here, which had got thin mica windows on it with supporting grids to uh, withstand the pressure of the gas in the expansion chamber. And you can see large numbers of particles coming out in various directions. And these alpha particles are all of about the same range. They are actually foreshortened a bit here and here, but that's because these ones are coming out through the micro window at an angle, and the distance trip that passes through uh, distance in the micro is longer than when they're coming out at right angles to the window. Now, you had lots of particles to play with here, and you have to remember that these are the particles produced in about 1 50th of a second by the proton beam striking the target, even after you have cut down the proton beam to a mere fraction of what was available. Now the part down below, which is not really showing properly, shows the difference between this picture and what you get when you have heavy hydrogen as the bombarding particle. You can see that you get all sorts of ranges present. And you get some very long range alpha particles coming out as well. Uh, next slide, please. Now here is a picture taken with a very small proton beam, so you only get a few disintegrations, and you can pick out ones that are coming out in opposite directions. Here is one this side, and there's one the other side. It's very easy to do these experiments with heavy hydrogen because the particles are so energetic. They have a range of about 12 centimeters, whereas the range of what Rutherford always referred to as very swift alpha particles from thorium C dash had a range of only 8.6 centimeters. And here is the nuclear reaction written out down below. Next slide, please. Now, this is another picture taken at this time showing you two different types of reaction occurring. Here is a fast alpha particle coming out, it had a range of over 12 centimeters, but uh, that would have struck the wall of the chamber, so we used bigger windows here. And here's the other half of the lithium atom coming out the other way. And uh, an interesting thing occurs here, there's another particle coming right down here. It doesn't have anything to do with the disintegration that produced those two. It's produced by this reaction down here. When you have lithium-6 bombarded by heavy hydrogen, you can get the formation of lithium-7 with the emission of a very fast proton. 
the ionization is much less per centimeter of track, and actually this proton has a range of about 30 centimeters. Now, next slide, please. Now, I'll just say a word about the other experiments that were going on in various places at this time to try and produce streams of fast particles. This is a, a picture of the arrangement used by Bright and Tove, uh, working I think with the Carnegie Institute, where they used a Tesla coil arrangement. This arc down arrangement appears here, the capacitor and the primary of this Tesla transformer. The secondary of it is simply a great many turns of fine wire wound round on uh, a glass tube. Now, with that, they were able to produce quite high voltages, and later on, they were able to apply these voltages to uh, uh, a multi-section uh, evacuated tube. <coughs> Next picture, please. Now, this is a, another method that uh, was used uh, <coughs> out, out in, in Berkeley. Uh, it was the resonant transformer method. It's really essentially the same as uh, here in the last slide, where you had a transformer. Here's the primary of the transformer, just one turn. Here's the secondary, which is tuned to the frequency of the primary circuit. And this particular apparatus was used for producing very penetrating X-rays, in other words, gamma rays. And uh, there was a cathode uh, here at Earth potential. And uh, when this went to a high potential, you had very fast electrons striking this star. The coil did not require any insulating uh, uh, material to support it. It was a, a reasonably thick copper tube. It's a great advantage if you can avoid uh, solid dielectrics when you're dealing with high voltages, and particularly high voltages at high frequencies, because you get dielectric losses in your insulators, which produces heat, and the quality of insulating material always decreases with the rise of temperature. But here you have the advantage that all the high voltages inside are steel vessel of this sort, no high voltages outside. Now that was used, that arrangement was used for treating people uh, afflicted with uh, cancer using the penetrating instruments produced. Uh, next slide, please. This is the arrangement that was used at, at Berkeley by Lawrenson for producing fast particles. It's really in effect a number of transformers, ordinary power transformers connected in series. There were slightly special transformers in that. There was an independent secondary winding, low voltage set winding at the high tension end of this first transformer. And uh, that was used to supply the inward voltage to the second transformer and so on. And this arrangement had the advantage that you had intermediate potentials here and here which could be connected to suitable points on your multi-state accelerating tube. It was an advantage which that voltage multiplying circuit had that I described that we used in the Cambridge accelerator. Uh, this uh, apparatus was also used for the treatment of cancer. Next slide, please. Now, this is, I think, the first published picture of the Van de Graaff machine. Van de Graaff was, was on to this, I think it was 1930. Uh, he was a student at MIT. And it's an extremely simple apparatus. Here you have your sphere at the top. Your charging belt is just a silk belt, a few inches wide, and driven by an electric motor down here. I think he said that the entire cost of this apparatus was under a hundred dollars, and yet it produced something well over a million volts. Now the Van de Graaff machine is very well suited for nuclear disintegration work, 
because it produces uh, a steady potential and uh, anything that's electrostatic usually gives you a high voltage but very small currents. For example, a wind source machine will give you many thousands of volts output, but the currents that are available are measured just in micro amperes. But that's all you need for nuclear disintegration work. A current of something like a couple of micro amperes is equivalent from the point of view of numbers of particles to uh, something like 150 grams of radium. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a later development of the Van de Graaff machine. Uh, a very familiar picture, I think, to uh, a lot of people. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was another of the early types of Van de Graaff machine uh, here in the United States. I think it was uh, uh, Dal and uh, Chu who worked on this. You have the belts, horizontal belts here. Here's your high voltage terminal, and here is your multi section tube. Now, another development of the Van de Graaff machine was that carried out at, at Wisconsin by Herb Parkinson and Kirst. Next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned these early forms of Betatron, the type we were using in Cambridge and the type that Biderot used. The first successful uh, Betatron was uh, uh, produced by Kirst and it depended on the theory. I think it was uh, worked out mainly by server. And they went into this question of the focusing of particles as they went round on the circular orbit here. Here's the orbit. And uh, it was shown that the field uh, should, in the neighborhood of the orbit, fall off with a, a power of r, say r to the n, proportional to 1 over r to the n. And they showed that the value of n there should be somewhere between naught and 1. If it's naught, you get no focusing in one direction and the best focusing in the other, and vice versa if the index is uh, at the other limit 1. Let's say 1 the first time, well, then you make naught and 1 are the two limits. So you take a figure somewhere in the middle, and you get focusing <coughs> both in the radial direction, that is if a particle wanders out here a bit, it comes back onto the orbit, and it works in the bottom. It goes astray in this direction, and is parallel to the axis here, then there are also forces bringing it back onto the orbit. Well, as a result of this proper understanding of focusing in a circular orbit like that, which is absolutely fundamental, to uh, a lot of modern machines. Kirst and Server, with a very small apparatus, I think it's shown in the next slide or the slide after. Uh, here's the dimensions of it. It's under 20 inches this way. This is the core of the magnet right here. Here are the both pieces. And they're tapered like this to give you a feeling falling off here with roughly about the inverse square root of the distance. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the actual apparatus, the magnet round here, and uh, the donut, as it's called, in here. Now, with that very simple bit of apparatus, uh, Kirsten Server were able to produce uh, <coughs> electrons of well over 1 million electron volts energy. Uh, I think I'm near the end of the slides, is that so? I forgot whether there's another or not. Oh, well, we, I think perhaps we leave it at that. The time is now gone, and uh, I'm stopping at this point where uh, only dealing with these early stages. It will take a very long time to talk about the later stages. And in most cases, you'll find that when you go from one type of accelerator, to the next stage of producing still faster particles, there's some new principle 
comes in. Maybe a principle of phase focusing, principle of uh, alternating gradient focusing, and uh, with the introduction of these uh, new principles that come in, the capabilities of these uh, uh, big machines have been gradually extended over the years. Now, I must close there and just thank you for listening to me so uh, attentively for the past hour or very nearly. Thank you very much.